All right, well, thank you, George. I could only dream of being as inspiring as you, but that's why, that's why you're a fantastic mentor, so thank you. So I'd like to begin, however, by endorsing something that Joey said earlier this morning. In, I strongly support his assertion that science needs an upgrade. In fact, we desperately need an upgrade. For a bit of perspective as to why that is, before 1800, scientists primarily communicated through private correspondence. But at the turn of that century, we revolutionized everything by going from letters to communications to journals, which then peer-reviewed submissions and made them available to anyone who could pay. If that sounds a little bit familiar, that's because we still largely do things that way today. That is to say, despite the tremendous advantages in communication technologies that we have now, despite the fact that science would be much more efficient and reliable if done more like open source software, we don't do it that way. It's hard to change systems, and it's even harder to change cultures. So if we want to do it, then returning to the topic of magic, we may need a magic trick. Now, Nicholas has said that science, of the sciences, bio may be the new digital. So if we want to upgrade science to the digital era, maybe we should start here. And as George has commented, we have an amazing new tool for editing DNA. And DNA, when you think about it, a mouse is really just a living program written in DNA. And thanks to the advent of CRISPR, we now have a means of editing that DNA. So as, as George outlined, CRISPR, while natively it's a gift from nature, it takes dyed RNA, and it goes and finds a DNA sequence that has that exact same matching sequence. And in its native form, it cuts it, which is how we can then edit it, because the cell responds by incorporating our altered gene. So this allows us to reprogram the organism, which we've now been able to do for a little over two years. And here is a very small subset of the organisms we've done it for. Because CRISPR is very easy to use, and it works in pretty much everything. It's pretty close to magic. But it doesn't work for everything. So suppose you wanted to make a mouse here that has a new trait, immunity to Lyme disease. Now, we haven't done this yet. I have some ideas as to how we might. But why would you want to do that? Well, we catch, we catch Lyme disease from ticks because they acquire the causative bacterium from mice. Almost all Lyme infections come from ticks that bite infected mice and then bite us. So if we could immunize the mice, then we could potentially get rid of Lyme disease. But there's a problem. Take this mouse and release it into the wild where it will mate with a wild mouse. Half of the offspring will inherit the altered gene. And this is true as you go down through the generations because that's how inheritance normally works. And since our alteration probably doesn't help the mice since the Lyme bacterium doesn't seem to hurt them, natural selection will probably weed it out. And there's a lot more wild mice out there than engineered mice that we could ever breed in the lab. But remember that CRISPR is magic. And here is the trick. If we encode CRISPR along with an alteration, then introducing that DNA into the cell will cause CRISPR to cut the target gene as normal, replace it with the edited version, which now also encodes the CRISPR system, which means that expression of that CRISPR system in the organism will cut the other chromosome, causing the cassette to be copied over again. So now, the organism has two copies, which means that when this, say, mouse, which is Lyme resistant, would then hypothetically mate with a wild mouse, all of its offspring would inherit a copy. And along with that copy, they would have the CRISPR system, which would be programmed to, again, cut the wild version of the gene and copy the cassette over again. So all of those offspring would inherit it. And editing would happen again, going from one to two copies in every generation, down through the generations, until all of the population has been edited. So if you think of nature as a series of living programs, self-replicating programs interacting out there, then this is a way to speak that language. The operating the operating language of nature is DNA, and we are now learning to speak it. We call this a CRISPR gene drive, because the CRISPR system 
drives the change that we want to make through the wild population. And we could use this potentially to eradicate Lyme disease like this, if we can make a, a mouse that is resistant to Lyme. We could use it to potentially eradicate malaria further afield, dengue, schistosomiasis, other, other plagues of, of the tropical world. We could use it to control invasive species, allowing damaged ecosystems to heal. In Hawaii, there's a number of native birds that are going to go extinct unless we do something because of mosquitoes that give them bird malaria. We could use this to remove mosquitoes from Hawaii. You could go to, and go to vacation in Hawaii and not fear getting bitten by a mosquito. That would be nice. We could potentially, <laughs> we could potentially <clears throat> get rid of broadly toxic insecticides by instead programming the insect pests that normally eat our crops to simply not like the taste. Again, nature's operating system is the language of DNA and we are learning to speak it. But this poses a tremendous challenge at the same time because this technology alters the shared environment. How can we determine whether, when, and how to use it? How can we ensure that it is only ever developed and used with wisdom and humility to build a better world? And the answer is not using the traditional mode of science because gene drives will require public support if they are ever to be used. And why should anyone trust scientists who insist on doing their work on their own and in secret until they deem it necessary to disclose it? Why? We chose, we chose to publish our findings on what we thought the capabilities of this technology would be before we ran any experiments in the laboratory because we wanted to set a precedent that the public discussion should start before the experiments. That way, it can inform and guide those experiments and the technology itself can be designed to address problems during development. So that's one reason, frankly, why I'm throwing this out there. Should we consider building a gene drive to make mice immune to Lyme disease? and consequently, get rid of Lyme. I'm asking you. That's good to hear. Please mention it to others, because this needs to be a broad discussion. Clearly, there is interest there, and, and, and we will definitely look at it. But more broadly, gene drive technology must be developed more like open source software, but even more so. That is, it needs to be a collaborative effort that invites everyone in society if they are willing to participate. So this would be a much more open and responsive model of doing science than what is currently performed in most all fields. But if we can do it, if we can succeed and provide those positive examples, then that model in one subfield might then spread to the rest of science. And I would say that that would be a magic trick. Thank you.